Well, Fiona, thanks very much. And, you know, as a pediatrician, you've done a number of interviews, and I've seen some of them, <coughs> about why children should return to school and why they are at significantly lower risk. Um, do you want to talk to us a little bit about that and why the risk of child infection is low and why you think children should be going back to school? Yeah, thanks for that. Yes, as you rightly said, I initially um, did some interviews in my personal capacity, but also over time, the consensus grew amongst uh, us as a pediatric community. And you may have seen over the weekend the media uh, statement that was released by SAPA, which is the South African Pediatric Association, that really sums up how we as a pediatric community feel. And I think the first uh, thing I just want to say is uh, we are fully aware of the anxiety and the fear that exists uh, and by now is really instilled in the hearts of many parents. And we have been fielding their questions for some time now. Um, but just to put it in perspective, at the start of the, of the crisis, a lot of what was decided at the time was not based on, on science from COVID because we didn't have any data to, to base it on. It was based on assumptions that on previous epidemics, either previous SARS epidemics or then the seasonal flu epidemics that we have each year. And so the decisions were made to close down schools. The assumption was made that children will be super spreaders of the, the virus as they are for other viral infections. And the assumption was made that children will be worse affected because we know that with other respiratory viruses, a lot of children will get sick from RSV virus, influenza virus, and so forth. As time went by and more data came to be published, primarily from what happened in China and then moved over to Europe and now the United States, we actually came to realize that many of our assumptions was incorrect as far as COVID goes. So one was the risk of infection to children. And what we've seen is that for reasons that we haven't ex um, completely um, teased out yet, children for biological reasons seems to be less infected than children. So if you look at the worldwide numbers at the moment, less than 1% in some instances, some studies is less than 3%, but a very low percentage of these cases are in children under the age of 18. So small, for, it certainly affects children less than 18, far, far less than the adult community. So that's the one thing. Then there was the concern that children will infect a lot of other people. And that has come to also be shown not to be true. So in some of the household cluster studies, um, we were able to find or see that only 10% of households had a child as an index case in a household. So 90% of the time, the index case or the contact case in the household was an adult and not a child. There were some uh, studies done in New South Wales where schools were not completely closed. I think the school had 780 odd students and staff members, and they had nine children and nine adults uh, who tested positive. And there were only two secondary cases uh, in that school as a total. So definitely the data that we have, and let's say that you know the data is, is hot off the press and the data is accumulating over time. But the data that we certainly have is showing the complete opposite to what we assumed. And then there's the, the risk of, um, we spoke about the risk of transmission, the risk of infection, but also the risk of serious symptoms. And again, we were very surprised to see that study after study showing that children is far less likely to have serious symptoms. So the, the vast majority of them can have completely asymptomatic. They may not show any symptoms. Then there's a big portion that will have mild symptoms, which is similar to what they may have had in the past with colds and flus. And if you take about a thousand children and they all have coronavirus, only two in that thousand children might require hospital care 
and you will be unlucky if if there's any deaths in that group of of a thousand children, which is a completely different scenario when you look in the adult world. So we were as pediatricians very uh, grateful but surprised to see that children in fact have far less severe symptoms. So all in all, when you look at the risk um, of infection to begin with, the risk of transmitting the virus, the risk of getting significantly sick, and obviously the risk of death is completely different in school-going children, in fact, in all children younger than 18, than what we are seeing in the adult data. So that's looking at risk. Then we also have to look on the other side of how effective is the measures that were put in place? What data do we have to say that school closure is an effective intervention to spread the the, um, transmission of COVID? And the reality is that the science is completely lacking. Um, There is no data to say that closing schools in particular is extremely helpful on a on a population level to stop the transmission of the virus. And in fact, some of the modeling studies that was done in the UK, but based on the data from China, suggested that only about 2% of all the deaths could have been prevented by school closure. So then if we then say, okay, well, what are the risks to the child with an an extended school lockdown? You know, what, what price are the children paying for an intervention that does not seem to be necessary for their sake. You know what, we know that those who have been in an extended lockdown, as you've mentioned, a vast majority of children do not have any access to online education at home. I think the last statistics showed that only 20% of all learners had access to education during this two and a half months. The, the question is what around the safety of the children, the nutrition of the children, and the mental health of the children. And, and if you add to that, that coronavirus is going to be with us for a foreseeable future, then at what point in time do we actually stop punishing the children mm. with um, keeping education away from them? Mm. So I think if you do that risk-benefit analysis for us as a pediatric community, the message is very clear that the benefits for children to return to education far outweighs their risks. Mm. So if I hear you correctly, you you would be saying that um, in terms of children, the risk is really low and there's greater harm in keeping children out of the school system and losing the academic year than they ever would be from uh, from the virus, given the science uh, at this particular time. No, look, I mean, obviously, as a, as a parent and as someone working with children every day, every sick child is, mm. is something we've got, we're worried about and we don't mm. like. Every death is, is tragic. Mm. But I think it's important to help to put it in perspective. And I, I, in my practice, try to say to parents last winter, what was your child's risk last winter for a serious respiratory illness mm. or in worst case scenario, death from a respiratory illness? And the reality is the estimates is that last year of the 11,000 influenza deaths in the country, about 550 were children, school going children. So that Mm -hmm. gives you like 5% of the influenza deaths were Mm -hmm. actually in school going age children. But yet last winter, no one took the flu vaccine. No one took the children's temperature. No one screened Mm -hmm. them for symptoms. No one wore a mask or washed Mm -hmm. their hands. So relatively speaking, is Mm -hmm. the risk to the child greater, Mm -hmm. bearing in mind that schools have the ability to protect their learners Mm -hmm. um, and the measures that was mentioned by the minister? Mm -hmm. Is that relative risk really greater than last year? And my personal opinion is no. In many aspects, the risk to the child is actually much less. So then you have to say that have to have access to education um, and to have access to stimulation and safety, because let's not forget that about 25 to 30% of essential workers and healthcare workers have child minding responsibilities. So what has been happening to those children? 
you know, if their parents have been at hospital mm. working, where do they access care and, and safety? It's mm. probably their grandparents. So, you know, so there's on so many levels that, mm. that it is the right decision to open the schools. Would mm. have it been ideal if it was summer now? Uh, yes, of course, but we don't have that choice. We, mm. they, we, that choice is not given to us. And to, to stay locked down and to keep the schools closed longer is just not um, responsible or <coughs> acceptable. <coughs> Dr. Kritzinger, there's a, a question here from Deloise who asks about comorbidities amongst children. So children with diabetes, children with asthma. Yeah. What would your advice in, in this regard be? Yeah, so you may have seen things circulating in a lot of that data, again, is based on the adult cases, because 99% of all the COVID cases in the world is adults. And it's been very clear from the adult literature that obesity, heart disease, chronic lung disease, and immunosuppression, hypertension is significant comorbidities. When it comes to the pediatric data, um, the data is far less clear but I think it is safe, and we as a pediatric community also assumes that similar comorbidities will, will be present in children. It's interesting, though, that when you look at the data, some of the U.S. studies um, that reported on 350 kids, only about 40% of them had a, had a comorbidity. About 16% of them had asthma. Um, but interestingly enough, obesity. So obesity mm -hmm. seems to be a risk factor even in school-going children. Mm -hmm. um, but some of the Italian studies, only a quarter of the hospitalized children had comorbidities. So I would still say that children with severe immunosuppression, children with severe cardiac disease or respiratory disease, children who are post-transplant, um, children who are uh, immunosuppressed, those are comorbidities. I think the big, the most common thing is obviously asthma. Asthma is one of the most, well, it is the commonest respiratory condition in children. But I just want to clarify that mild or moderate asthma that is well controlled on medication per se is not a significant risk factor and is not a reason not to return to school. Mm. So there's a lot of questions coming in around masks, and I'm sure you've been uh, inundated at your practice uh, uh, about masks. What's better, masks or face shields? Uh, can yeah. you get carbon dioxide poisoning from wearing a mask too long? Uh, what is your, yeah. you, do you want to talk about kids and masks? Um, a lot of parents send yeah. stuff through about that. Yeah, so definitely we'd say children five years and older um, would become um, the age group where masks is should be wear, worn. Um, the big thing about a mask is that it, you have to wear it properly. You have to use it properly. Mm. So there's a lot of education needed to make sure the child actually wears the mask correctly and that it doesn't inadvertently make him touch his face more because it doesn't fit well if it falls off or it goes over his eyes. So I think a well-fitted mask works, it works well, and it is completely safe, even to wear for extended periods of time. I mean, someone made the comment that, you know, doctors who operate for hours on you wear a mask for hours and they keep mm. doing very intricate and very complex mm. procedures and no doctor has ever passed out or died because he wore a mask, <laughs> mask for hours before the mm. poisoning. So it is safe to wear a mask, but I think mm. that it must be the right age. We, children under the age of five should not be wearing masks unless the child is maybe emotionally mature and they're able to wear it correctly, but definitely not a mm. mask over a child under the age of two years. Absolutely. There it's contraindicated. But in school going children, a mask is very effective, mm. provided it's worn correctly. Yeah. And what about teachers and their vulnerability? Uh, you know, uh, I, I, we were having a discussion in the break. You, I think you were saying a teacher's more vulnerable in the staff room than they are in the classroom. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So the children, uh, the adults, um, definitely are far more likely to get infected from other adults than they are from children. That's been shown in a, even in a household um, and even on a population level. 
So how the teacher gets to school and the behavior of the teacher is ultimately going to determine their risk. So if they follow social distancing, if they wear a mask appropriately, and if they wash their hands, they are protected. That is been shown over and over again that that's the most effective strategy. Mm. Uh, and it's the intervention that works the best. Mm. So I think that the teachers need to be very careful about their behavior outside of the classroom especially when they get into the staff room uh, and have meals or have breaks, um, because that's actually a bigger risk for them than the time that they spend in the classroom. With the children. Um, Pam's asking us a question here. What is the minimum requirement for a quality of mask for children? Would you, do you have a sort of a standard uh, recommendation? Yeah look, yeah, look, I think actually the, the Department of Health in the Western Cape sent out a very helpful link to what is considered a good cloth mask but you basically want three layers you know you want a very tightly woven material on the outside and then the layer in the middle and the layer um, in inside mm. but more importantly obviously those masks must be washed every day at a high temperature and preferably ironed because that will help to to kill all the remaining viruses. Mm. So there's lots of um, good quality information. Also, there's lots of patterns to make your own mask. Mm. So I think we can maybe share that at the end of the, the mm. show. Yeah. Well, great. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kritzinger. And it's been really great to have you on. And I would love to have you back on it again uh, at, a, at another time to discuss where we're at. Obviously, the science is moving all the time. And you know, this is a point exactly. I made in the show two shows ago that you know, you've got to, government's got to be alive to the moving science. I mean, you know, I, I think back exactly. at the beginning of the AIDS pandemic, some people's view on ARVs and, and the relationship between HIV and AIDS, but completely, the science moved completely on it. And I think government's got to keep up with the cutting edge of, uh, and be informed by the science. No, for sure, we, we cannot ignore it. I think we also have to acknowledge that we do not have all the answers and the data that we base our answers on is going to change. And we, as the scientific community and the pediatric community, is keeping a very, very close eye in every day of what is published, what is circulating amongst our peers, and how we should change our recommendations. Um, so we are committed to finding uh, the correct data and spreading the correct information. And we are very aware that anxiety and fear is difficult to control. Mm. And therefore, I think all of us have a responsibility to put the data um, into a context that allows parents to find mm. some some degree of calm and rationality because mm. also unfortunately some media continues to spread fake news and poor information mm. and fuels the anxiety and the fire you know mm. yeah. which is not very helpful not very helpful at all well thank you dr kritzinger and obviously anyone uh, wanting to access your practice have you got a website or how do people get in touch with your practice Yes, yes, we do have a website. It's just chestandallergy.co.za and also um, SAPA, the South African Pediatric Association, mm. is busy getting their platforms, but they can be followed on Facebook and Instagram and on their website. Um, and yeah, I think parents, I would suggest that they try and get the information from reputable sources and try yeah. and stay yeah. away from um, non-scientific sources. Yeah. Well, I think that's excellent advice. And thank you for making time for us and for our viewers today, Dr. Kritzinger. And I look forward to welcoming you back.